Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. His ministry, hearts and submission, come on in. Yes. Come on in. We are worshiping this evening with Bree Babinax. I believe I'm saying her name correctly. Worthy of it all. We do not own the rights to this music. We are using this music to worship to as we come in to his ministry, Hearts and Submission, our Tuesday night Bible study as we sit at the feet of Jesus. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Marys, come on in. <laughs> let's sit at the feet of Jesus. Yes, let's take off this day. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for his ministry, Hearts in Submission, his ministries, it all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to sit at your feet, to glean from you, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus, and to hang on your every word. We thank you for unpacking, for uh, bringing supernatural divine revelation to Herod's persecution and the Acts of the Apostles Bible study series. We thank you for your word. We thank you for revelation. We thank you for supernaturally and divinely opening our eyes and our hearts and downloading all of this beautiful holy scriptures into our hearts that we're able to apply it to our lives today because we know that we have been called to be witnesses in the earth and reconcile souls back to the kingdom of God by preaching Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for our Bible study tonight and we thank you for this Bible study series, Acts of the Apostles. Thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ for joining us. Listen, we're going to dev right in to our lesson tonight, but I would like to just bring you a little bit up to speed on last week. Minister Sarah, I'm Evangelist Keisha. Minister Sarah on last week, she actually unpacked, packed, did a deep dive with us on the church in Antioch. That was lesson 18. And just pretty much uh, speaking to that, the miraculous conversion of Cornelius, which was actually covered in lesson 16 and 17, right? So you're going to have to go back if you're not up to speed with us, but that's okay because the lessons are out there. Uh, you can go out and subscribe, visit our a YouTube channel where all of these lessons are housed. There is a library and a plethora of these lessons out there. Um, the Acts of the Apostles uh, playlist will give you the opportunity to go back and start from the beginning and bring you up to where we are today in lesson 19, Herod's persecution and death. But on last week in lesson 18, the, 18, the church in Antioch that minister Sarah did a deep dive with us on the miraculous conversion of Cornelius opened the door to the gospel to the Gentiles. Yeah, God had uh, made it very clear. Elohim God made it very clear to the church that he accepted the Gentiles just as he did the Jews for salvation. Now the church had entered a new phase of evangelism and evangelizing the world. Luke, who is the writer, he actually shifted, he shifts his attention from the church in Jerusalem to the newly established church in Antioch. And that's where uh, the, the body of Christ first were called Christians. 
Christ ones. But as Minister Sarah also makes reference to, we are the elect of God because we know that the word uh, Christian is not always used in the con in the context that it should be used. It's used very loosely nowadays. So we make emphasis to being the elect of God, being ambassadors of Christ in the kingdom of God. But that is where in the church of Antioch is where believers were first called Christians. This church would soon serve as the base from which Paul Apostle Paul launched his missionary journeys, okay? And so on next week, that's going to be unpacked and, and there will be a deep dive on that. But this week, we're going to talk about uh, Herod's persecution and debt in this lesson 19, all right? So come with us as we delve in. But before we actually do that, yeah, you know that I like to let you know uh, about our works cited, the True Jesus Church. This is the Bible study guide that we are using. You can go out there to their website to bsg.tjc.org and reference this information for yourself. And then there's questions that are actually asked in the study and we don't always go just line by line with those particular questions as we are opening up and Holy Spirit is unveiling and revealing and pulling back uh, these chapters in this Acts, the book of Acts, and opening it up to us in a new and fresh way, but always keeping to the word as it is the Holy Scriptures. But you can go out there to the Bible study guide, to True Jesus Church, bsg.tjc.org, and reference the, the study guide there for yourself. Actually, we encourage you to do that. Um, and I equally use Life in the Spirit Study Bible, okay? And equally, before we close out, we never ever close out without giving you the opportunity to receive Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior or rededicate your life. Someone that is listening to this Bible study and Holy Spirit got your attention and you are sitting here with us, gleaning with us to the very end and you want to become a part of the body of Christ, right? We always close with the plan of salvation. We never ever close out without giving you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Yahshua HaMashiach Jesus, our true and living King into your heart as Lord and Savior. We reference Warrior Chronicles, Born into Battle, Kingdom Warrior Encounters, the book. There is a plan of salvation, a Kingdom Warrior plan of salvation prayer in the back of the book and deliverance prayer in faith that we use when we close out, okay? So you will have that opportunity. Let's keep moving. All right, our lesson 19, Herod's persecution and death. Now, there were a, a number of Herods, okay, in the Bible. So we wanna make sure that you know who we're talking about. But before we do that, let's just get into the setting. Okay, so if you have been following along with us, then you will kind of be right here and you'll know that we're that Herod actually, you know, was persecuting the Christians. Okay, he King Herod, right, was persecuting the Christians as well, but he was persecuting and laid hands on the apostles. But let's get into the setting and we'll move into talking about which Herod this is. So we are referencing tonight and studying chapter 12, verses 1 through 24 in Acts, okay? Lesson 19. And the setting here, let's set the backdrop so that you can see exactly where we are. Though the believers who came to Antioch, the Lord threw, <laughs> threw the believers who came to Antioch, the Lord had planted his church in this city, in Antioch. The work of the Lord thrived there and many were added to the church. At about this time, another wave of persecutions, you know there's been persecution all the way through. We 
experience persecution now when you are serving the true and living god and you are preaching jesus no matter your platform the true and living god the true jesus the true jesus yahshua hamashiach you will experience persecution but not like most oftentimes not like they did in the acts of the apostles in the acts of the apostles the apostles experienced such extreme persecution as well as our brothers and sisters across the globe are equally experiencing persecution and then those of us who not on this scale you know experiencing persecution because of our belief systems and who we serve the true and living god the godhead father son and spirit will equally and do experience some degree of persecution right okay so now back to this setting so that you can see it at this time another wave of persecutions came over the church in jerusalem this time instead of the religious leaders like the sanhedrin council for example instead of the religious leaders it was herod the king who laid hands on the apostles and when they say laid hands yeah literally laid hands on the apostles he executed james and arrested peter intending to put Peter equally to death. This passage in this lesson tells us of the Lord's miraculous deliverance of Peter, the punishment on Herod, and the outcome for the church. And our key verse here, just so you can, you'll hear it as we're going through the outline, but I just want to highlight that for you. The key verse here is acts 12 and 24 that says but the word of god grew and multiplied now we encourage you to use the new king james version or the king james version because that's versions that have not been tampered with as much you will hear me sometimes using the amplified version in different versions but i always go and i compare the versions to make sure that they are saying the same thing that the new king james version is saying and the uh the the king james version is speaking to okay and when i use the amplified it's amplified it's not adding to or taking away so that's important to say all right so let's move so you have the background you got the backdrop in the setting that through the believers who came to antioch right that the lord had planted his church in this city okay so no matter the persecution believers still being added souls being reconciled to the body of christ all right now let's talk about this herod right who is this herod who are the various herods mentioned in the bible because as i stated this family tree was massive all right so who which herod are we making reference to in this acts of the apostles that we're talking to and speaking to tonight there were various herods mentioned in the bible now just to give you just a couple right king herod the father herod antipas the son and herod agrippa the grandson and that's who we're actually making mention to tonight that's who we're speaking to tonight who's doing these horrific things and Herod's persecution and death. So know that when you hear this name as it relates to this lesson 19, where we are in the Acts of the Apostles tonight in this chapter 12, we are making reference to Herod Agrippa, okay? In Acts 12, 1 through 24. That's who we're speaking to. But I would like to kind of share with you some information just to give you a little bit of history on these Herods mentioned in the Bible. As I stated, their family tree was massive, right? So it's good to have this background and a little bit of history on 
these hairs, okay? Instead of just giving you just the, the highlight and the overarching, you know, information about the grandson, let's just touch it a little bit. And that will kind of give you a bit of history. So when you're talking about it, when you're ministering or when you are sitting with Holy Spirit in your own time, and he's unveiling it to you, you then have some background knowledge about what he's sharing with you as he unveils and as he brings revelation, right? Okay, now this information that you see here on the screen, who are the various Herods mentioned in the Bible? I actually gleaned this information from gotquestions.com. Okay, so the answer is, let's just speak a little bit to that. There are several men in the New Testament referred to as Herod, right? These Herods were part of a dynasty, a partly hereditary, partly appointed line of Idumean, okay? And I broke that down so that I could pronounce that as best as I possibly could with my southern accent, okay? So the Idumean, 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 Idumean rulers over Israel during the days of the Roman Empire. Unlike other previous kings of Israel, the Herods were appointed. They were appointed by the Roman emperors and the Senate, okay? So they were appointed as kings. And it just kind of went down that family, you know, lineage down the line. So they inherited these thrones, right? They were appointed to these seats, okay, of in this hierarchy. They were actually appointed in the Roman Empire, all right, and by the Senate there, by the governing authorities, all right? So the Idumen, Idumen <laughs> is a noun, a native or inhabitant of Idumea, okay? which is equally a place. The it you men, okay, being the noun, okay, the adjective of that or pertaining to an ancient Idumea or Edom, the place, a historical region south of Judea and the Dead Sea mentioned in the Bible. All right, now, it was an, and that's Edom, okay? And you see a map here that I put up here just so that you can get an idea. And Minister Sarah, when you go back and you replay her messages and you glean, and if you were following with her, um, you then would see how she then breaks her lessons down. And she most oftentimes will share a map of the different places and regions that we're speaking to. But tonight I said, let me put up here for you the 13th century BC, uh, 125 BC, uh, the theoretical map of the region around 830 BCE, Edom is shown in yellow so that you can have an idea of where we're actually talking about, all right, and where they actually ruled, right? All right, it was an, Edom was an ancient kingdom in Transjordan, located between Moab to the northeast. The Arabian Desert was equally there, was the south and the east, okay? Most of its former territory is now divided between Israel and Jordan. And I think those are some very important facts. It's good to know that, right? Just in, to have an idea of what that actually looks like, okay? So now, the first of the Herods is often known as Herod the Great, okay? And I gave you an example uh, before on the, the first slide when I showed you the pictures of the father, the son, and then the grandson, because we're talking about the grandson right now, right? That's who we're, we're making reference to now, the grandson, okay? But the first of the Herods is often known as Herod the Great and is the one who sought to kill Yahshua, Jesus, in Matthew 2, 
in Matthew 2. So you go back and you look, uh, which who was the one that was trying to kill Jesus, right? And he was the one known for killing the babies and young boys, the Jewish boys. It was Herod the Great, right? By slaughtering all the infant boys, this Herod also tried to enlist the wise men to reveal the whereabouts of the baby Yahshua Jesus. I, our baby Jesus, who is no longer a baby, <laughs> he sits at the right hand of Elohim God, making intercession for us. He is our sovereign king. And at that time though, when he was born, Herod the Great was looking to assassinate him, to kill him, because of course, he heard that there was a king being born and that was Yahshua, Jesus, right? So by slaughtering all the infant boys, this Herod also tried to enlist the wise men to reveal the whereabouts of baby Yahshua, Jesus at the time. According to the Jewish historians, the first Herod also called Herod a Clastonite, S. Costanite <laughs> was the son of Antipar, a friend and deputy of King Hyrcanius. Hyrcanius? Yeah. All right. <laughs> My southern accent and as well may not be pronouncing it correctly, but let me then spell it out for you. Okay? H Y R C A N U S. Hyrcanius. He was made king in the room of Hyrcanius, his master, by the Senate of Rome. So the governing bodies, because we talked about that. We talked about how they actually became king and how they began to rule because they were appointed. They were elected. Okay. Now, the son of Herod the Great was Herod Antipas, who was referred to as Herod the tech, the tech arch, arch, the tech arch. And if you go back and you reference Matthew 14, 1 and Luke 3 and 1, then you can glean and, and see and hear more about him. And that will speak to in that passage of scripture in Matthew and Luke will speak more about the son, Herod's son. All right. Now that word tech arch, tech arch signifies that one who governs, one who governs a fourth part of a kingdom. His father, Herod the Great, divided his Lord kingdom into four parts and bequeathed them to his sons, an action confirmed by the Roman Senate. So they agreed to this. This Herod Antipas of Galilee the part of the kingdom assigned to him. He is the one Yahshua Jesus was sent to during his trials and eventually his crucifixion and go back and reference Luke 23. This same Herod Antipas was the Herod who had John the Baptist murdered in Matthew 14. So this is some good stuff. Make sure that you go out there and you reference these scriptures, right? Because it helps bring everything into perspective when you do that. And that's why I wanted to share the history of the Herods and this uh, family tree with you so that you would know exactly which Herod we were making reference to tonight. And what these Herods, just a highlight, a snippet of what they have done. Now, Herod Agrippa I is who we're talking about. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. And that's Acts 12. That's what we are studying tonight. It was he who persecuted the church in Jerusalem and had the apostle James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, and we're going to talk about that, put to death by the sword. By the hand of Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, whom we're making reference to in this lesson tonight. Okay. By the hand of Herod Agrippa I, James became the first apostle to be martyred. He became the first apostle to be martyred. Not the first follower 
of Yahshua HaMashiach, of Jesus Christ, or disciple, but the first apostle to be martyred is what it says here. Two of Agrippa the first daughters were, just, just so you know, uh, were Bernice and Drusilla, mentioned in Acts 24 and Acts 25. So when we get there, you then will probably hear their names again because there is an honorable mention here of Drusilla and Bernice being the daughters of Agrippa the first, okay? Now let's just speak to one more and that's uh, Agrippa's son, Herod Agrippa the second, okay? That's Herod Agrippa the second, right? Agrippa's son, Herod Agrippa the second was instrumental and this is key and Minister Sarah will actually speak to that in her lesson on next week because she has a lot to cover there. I don't know how we're going to break that down, but it has uh, that first part of his mission has parts one, two, and three, and she may be able to cover it all, and she may not, but you know we're going to get to it. But here's the deal, okay? So this is good information to know, so you will hear it again, that Agrippa's son, Herod Agrippa II, was instrumental in saving the Apostle Paul from being tried and imprisoned in Jerusalem by the Jews who hated his testimony of Yahshua, of Jesus, as the Messiah. King Agrippa, out of consideration for Paul being a Roman citizen, allowed Apostle Paul to defend himself, thereby giving Apostle Paul the opportunity to preach the gospel to all who were assembled. And you'll be able to reference that in Acts 25 through 26. King Agrippa II was the last of the lineage of the line of Herod. And after him, the family fell out of favor with Rome. After, because tonight, remember, we're speaking to Herod Agrippa, King Agrippa, uh, Herod the first Agrippa, okay? And so then after him, his son ruled. And he was the one that actually granted audience and mercy to the Apostle Paul. He was instrumental in saving the Apostle Paul. But we will cover that when we get to Acts 25 through 26. But I thought that that was some valuable information to actually share with you, right? Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. All right, and we got this information. We gleaned this from gotquestions.com. So you can actually go out there and equally view this information for yourself. Now, moving on. Now, what did we just share about Herod Agrippa the first? Okay, because the lesson is Herod's persecution and death. But I had to give you some background on Herod so that you would understand why he was persecuted and he he died. <laughs> and how he died, which is what's going to be really interesting as we keep moving forward in this lesson. But listen, Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, so I know you got that now. You're putting two and two together that it was this particular Herod, Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, the king of Jude Judea, okay, killed James, put Peter in prison, and was struck down by an angel. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're setting the backdrop. We've already done that with the setting and now just kind of highlighting that and reinforcing that. So as we move into and begin to read the scriptures in the outline, you'll have an idea of what we're talking about and you can then see it and flow with it as we go. Now look, Herod Agrippa I, being the grandson of Herod the Great and king over much of the earlier king's territory, he arrested and what happened? We know that he actually killed James, but what did? how did he do it? He beheaded James. He beheaded James, one of the first disciples of Jesus. Interesting, right? He was one of the first disciples of Jesus. And when Herod realized this act 
has increased his already significant support from the Sanhedrin Council, the governing authorities, right? He arrested Peter. He went after Peter when he realized that he was receiving accolades and support from the Sanhedrin Council, the governing bodies, right? He then went after the apostle Peter as well. And you can reference that in Acts 12, 1 through 3. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the outline. But I just want to share that with you. And some other translations in the Bible extend to Agrippa's intent specifically to bring to bringing Peter to a public trial. Okay? But we'll talk more about what happened with Peter. Because all of this is amazing. We do know that, of course, James was killed. He was beheaded. And Peter was in prison. And this, this lesson tonight will emphasize more on his miraculous release. Okay? And you'll see why. I mean, it's definitely miraculous. All right? Now, moving into the outline. Let's just talk about it. Okay? The outline. Herod, Herod's violence. Remember, Herod Agrippa the first, the grandson of Herod the Great, Herod's violence against the church. So if you don't hear me say Herod Agrippa the first, you know that that's who I'm making reference to in this uh, Acts 12, 1 through 24. So let's speak to this in the outline. Herod's violence against the church in Acts 12, 1 through 4, and I am going to actually read that as we go through this outline because I want to make sure that you have a grasp and a grip on the story. I broke it down to you in a way that to bring it home for you to give you a visual so that you can see it. But even as we read the scripture, then you see how it's applicable and you see the application there. So Herod's violence against the church, that's huge, right? And that's in Acts 12, 1 through 4. So I know that you have your word and I hope that you are following along with me. If not, you're making notes. And you definitely can go back and replay this so that you can do your own study. But let me just go ahead and read Acts 12, 1 through 4. And it says, Now, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, the governing bodies, the Sanhedrin Council, he proceeded further to seize Peter, Apostle Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, who is him, that's Apostle Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Now, when we speak to, in this, when the word, the Holy Scriptures speak to the four squads, I'm going to tell you more about those four squads in did you know. Okay, but I'm going to keep moving. But just have that in mind, highlight that in your mind, that when he was arrested, the Apostle Peter, he then was put in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers. And that can kind of give you an idea that it was a lot of soldiers that were actually guarding prison, uh, guarding Peter while he was in prison and delivered him to the four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Now, intending to then gives you an idea that that didn't happen. And let's talk about why. All right. Now, Peter delivered from prison. This is where we'll talk about that. And that is in Acts 12, 5 through 19. So what does it say there? Peter was thereby kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. All right, that kind of gives you a little bit about what the, those four squads looked like. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. 
And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that that was done by the angel, that 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 was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. So he didn't even know that this was real, okay? When they were past the first and the second set of guards on post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So the gates just opened because of course, you know, I'm sure that they were locked down. They were probably chained. Ain't no telling what type of big iron gates those were that were locked down with massive chains and locks and all of these different things, right? So when the angel and the apostle Peter where they, they passed that first and second set of guards on post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. So at that point, once the apostle Peter was indeed free and he was clear of the guards, they had, they were no, you know, they weren't aware of what was going on. They were probably sleeping or they were put in a daze, okay, by the angel of the Lord, right? So once he got down that one street and immediately the angel then departed from him, his assignment was up. He did what he needed to do because angels are uh, sent to us as helpers. They help the people of God accomplish our mission. Of course, with direction of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Spirit of God. So they are given, angels are given instructions on who to help and how to help them. They do what they need to do and they're gone. And so this angel then departed from him immediately, okay? And when Peter, the apostle Peter had come to himself, he said, look, he still thought that he was dreaming, right? Or that this was a vision. And when the apostle Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people that wanted him to be killed and martyred as well, just as they did with, with uh, uh, James, right? They wanted him beheaded. They wanted him martyred. They wanted him killed at that time, right? So he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he pondered this in his heart and in his mind, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as the apostle Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but she ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Right? They could, she couldn't believe it. She didn't even open the gate. She ran back in to make the announcement. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. They still didn't believe that it was him. They believed that it was an angel of the Lord, maybe coming to bring a message. Now, Peter continued to knock. He continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were shocked. But, mon but motioning to them with his hand, he said, keep silent. He wanted them to be quiet because of course they didn't really know what took place. They didn't know that the angel of the Lord came and released him and that it was just one street down, right? 
he so but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent he declared to them how the lord had brought him out of the prison and he said go tell these things to james and to the brethren and he departed and went to another place the next assignment that didn't detour him that didn't stop him Apostle Peter and the apostles, they were on the move. The disciples were on the move. The evangelists, they were on the move. All of the fivefold, they were on the move, which is what we should do. We should not allow persecution to stop us from doing what we have been called to do in this earth. By the way, that's why we're here, right? That is why we are here. What is our overarching purpose? That is the reconciliation of souls to the kingdom of God. That is to preach the salvation plan, the redemption plan of Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. So now, uh, the apostle Peter departed and he went to another place. Then, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. So, of course, they were trying to figure out, wait a minute, what happened? We weren't asleep. How did this man escape? He was chained. He was guarded by four squads of soldiers. And there was probably double chains and locks and gates and all of these things. So when, they, when he left like that, they were no wiser of what took place and how he actually escaped, right? So when daylight came, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. Yeah, he commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea and Caesarea and stayed there. Okay, so now he's on the hunt. He's looking for the apostle, Peter, because he's like, okay, so one of these guards let him go. Because there's no way possible from a natural standpoint that this man could escape. There's no way that he could escape, right? Okay, so that was Peter's deliverance from prison, his miraculous deliverance from prison. Now, let's look at Herod's death, right? And that's in 12 and I'm talking about Hex 12, 20 through 23. Now let's look at Herod Agrippa, the first one, the grandson of Herod the Great that we're talking about in this study tonight. Let's look at his death because that's what this lesson speaks to, Herod's persecution and death. Now, follow me. This Acts 12, 20 through 23. And it says, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid their friend, they asked for peace. So they were begging for mercy, right? They were like, listen, can you do something? Because he's on a rampage, right? Because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So they didn't want to starve <laughs> because he was on a rampage and because this miraculous deliverance of the apostle Peter from prison, he was not able to bring him, you know, before the, the you know, the, the people and put him on trial and martyr him. He wasn't able to kill him. Okay. So he's on a rampage right now. And so the people are asking for peace because why? Their country was being supplied with food. By the king by his country so on a set day herod arrayed in royal apparel sat on his throne and gave an oration to them a speech an oration to them a speech he gave a speech to them and the people kept shouting the voice of a god not of a man then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. Now look, 
Harris persecution and death. When you look at what took place, an angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give glory to Elohim God, the true and living God, the creator of all that exists, the Godhead. And he was struck dead and then eaten by worms. But wait a minute, look at this order. He was eaten by worms and died. He was struck, didn't die immediately, but he suffered a horrific death because before he actually gave up the ghost, gave up his spirit, all right? He was eaten by worms and died. Can you imagine? I kind of stayed there so that you, we don't skirt by that. That's horrible, okay? Ain't no, ain't no telling the smell and all of, and what type of worms were eating him or flesh-eating worms, of course. Well, thank you, Holy Spirit. Flesh-eating worms and when flesh is decaying and rottening and infected and inflamed like that and it's being eaten by worms, flesh-eating worms, you know that it stunk. And of course, I know that it was painful. <laughs> I don't even have to say that right so then immediately an angel of the lord struck him because he did not here's the key highlight this he did not give glory to elohim god for the apostle peter's deliverance from prison he was glorifying himself yeah he glorified himself just in everything he didn't give glory to god and, and whatever that speech entailed he didn't give glory to God. And because he didn't give glory to God, he was struck by an angel and was eaten by worms and died. All right, now, the last bullet point here for the outline, the word of God prevailed. And this is equally our key verse. Listen no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what you go through on your journey as you have been called and you have been purposed in this earth, as Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, that the plans that the Lord has for us are to prosper us, not to harm us, but to give us hope in a future and a great outcome. He knows the plans that he has for us and their plans to prosper us, not to harm us, but to give us hope in a great future and a great outcome. Equally, this Luke 4.18 that says, and it's, it's Isaiah 61 and 1 that says, the spirit of the Lord is upon us because he has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent us to heal the broken and hearted to, proc to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We are to preach Jesus in that manner, in that order, no matter what our platform is, the word of Elohim God must prevail. And here is the warning in that. I admonish you that in whatever you do as an ambassador of Christ Jesus, no matter who you are and what you're doing, know that the word of God will prevail. And here's the thing. <laughs> Hence, Herod Agrippa the first, okay? The grandson of Herod the Great being struck by an angel of the Lord because he didn't give God the glory. He didn't give God, Elohim God, the credit. So in everything that we do and every word that we speak, we need to give the Godhead, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that we're glorifying God and whatever we see, say and whatever we do and the way we live our lives and whatever platform you know, as marketplace ministers, whatever your office is, make sure that you are glorifying God with your life. Yeah. Because what? In this last bullet point in this outline, the word of God, it will prevail. And what does it say? That key verse. So if you don't remember what it says, let me just share it with you. It says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of, of the Lord is going to prevail. 
it's going to be fulfilled. The prophecies, the word of the Lord is going to be fulfilled. And every promise in this word, in the word of God, is going to manifest. It is going to actually indeed prevail, right? It's going to prevail. So no matter what it feels like, no matter what it looks like, no matter what you're going through, right where you are in your situation, a persecution not to the magnitude of the apostles, right, and of the disciples, but right where you are, don't be discouraged, don't be dismayed, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path and he will send angels on assignment to help you fulfill your mission and through the spirit of God, Holy Spirit, who will give supernatural and divine direction and guidance, okay? The Godhead working in tandem to fulfill the purpose of the kingdom of God, and that is to reconcile souls back to the kingdom of God. That is to preach Jesus, the redemption plan of the Lord. That's exactly what it is. The word of God will prevail. The word... Acts 12, 24, this is the last verse. But the word of God grew and multiplied. So the church, there were still numbers being added to the church, no matter what they went through, okay? I mean, look, hence Herod's persecution and death. <laughs> Touch not God's anointed and do his prophets no harm. That's what the word of God says. All right, now, I'm not going to go beyond uh, this outline here, but there is uh, one general analysis that I did just want to share with you, just a point to ponder, just to reinforce what can we learn from this chapter about Herod's character. Just to throw that out there, Herod was a cruel man who killed innocent people for his own political gain. He was also pompous and arrogant and those are things that the Lord hate you can see you reference Galatians uh, 5 22 through 23 you know that that is not a man who yielded the fruit of the Spirit of the Lord you can tell and you know right there who his life was governed by and it wasn't our sovereign King it wasn't uh, the character and the spirit of our true and living God who was ruling and, uh, you know, giving him guidance and direction. But he was receiving his instructions from the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of the light, not the kingdom of God. The byproducts of this man's character was that of the synagogue of Satan, not that of God. Elohim God, the true and living God, which is his character. What is his character? Go and read Galatians. And you reference Galatians 5, 22 through 23 is our moral compass. And you will see that he was not yielding any of the byproducts of the spirit of the Lord, the fruit of the spirit, that his character was one of selfish gain and political gain and he was pompous and he was arrogant and he was a murderer nothing that represents our true and living god okay all right so i am going to actually stop right there all right thank you so much for joining us tonight but look i did tell you that i have a did you know for you so before you go did you know okay James, the brother of John, in Acts 2, we actually talked about, this was James, the son of Zebedee, who our Lord told that he should be baptized with the baptism he was baptized with. And if you go and you reference Matthew 20 and 22, and let me just read that for you, that Matthew 20 and 22, and see what that says. That says here, follow me, track with us. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. 
So we have to be careful what we say and what we ask for. James, did you know? Go and read in the entire Matthew, right? But look at that Matthew 20, chapter 20, where James, the brother of John, this was James, the son of Zebedee, who our Lord, Yahshua Jesus, that he said that he should be baptized with the baptism he was baptized with, meaning the baptism of martyrdom. And he was the first martyr among the apostles. The death he was put to was one of the four capital punishments among the Jews and was reckoned by them the most disgraceful of them all and was inflicted upon, typically inflicted upon deceivers of the people and such and one James was thought to be. So they then, they put him in the category as a deceiver of the people because he was preaching Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus had already told him how he would actually die. And he referenced it as a baptism. To be baptized with the baptism he was baptized with. That was the baptism of martyrdom. Did you know? Did you know that? And now let's let's speak to the four squads, right? I thought that was interesting. So I wanted to share that with you. Now, of course, just to give you just a little bit of a reminder there, in Acts 12 and 4, what did it say about the four squads, right? So when he had arrested him, who was that? When uh, Herod Agrippa arrested the apostle Peter, when he arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover, right? So what does that look like? Did you know that the four squads were 16 soldiers divided into four watches so that four would be on watch at all times, two in the prison with the Apostle Peter and two at the door. So this is why you can imagine that uh, King Agrippa, King Herod uh, Agrippa the first, was so infuriated because he felt like he had been betrayed by the, the four squads of soldiers. Cause he's like, there's no way that 16 soldiers divided into four watches could actually, you know, not see this man get loose. He was chained and he was in prison. He was on lockdown and he was on, there, there was four soldiers on guard on each watch, two inside the prison and two outside the prison. So he was like, there's no way. And that's why he then commanded that those soldiers be assassinated, be killed. That they would be put to death. Because he said, there's no way that, that you know, this man could just by natural means escape this imprisonment. There was no way. But of course, it was supernatural and divine. And that just kind of speaks to the magnitude and the power of the angels that our sovereign king, that the Holy Trinity send to watch over us, send to help us accomplish assignments. And when I say the Holy Trinity, I'm speaking to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking to Elohim God. I'm speaking to uh our sovereign king, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, I am speaking to the spirit of our living God, the person of the Godhead. I'm speaking to that tripod, be the tripod beings, our deity, Father, Son, and Spirit, the person of God, persons, three in one, okay? angels that are subject to Elohim God sent to help complete assignments right in the earth for God's people. Yeah, so that's how 
he supernaturally and divinely escaped. <laughs> he was released by an angel. And these 16 soldiers divided into four watches. <laughs> Listen, in the natural, there was nothing that they could do. But in the end, die, face their own death. Because there's no way they, they could explain this man's release, right? All right, so we have come, brothers and sisters, in Christ Mary's, to the end of this lesson 19, Herod's Persecution and Death. Thank you for hanging in with us. And we will then, of course, see you on next week. But before we close out, of course, listen, we're going to pray. So hang around for the prayer because there may be something, you know, in your heart and you feel like you've been persecuted or you have grown weary. But take heart. And when you pray, thank our true and living King. Thank Elohim God. Thank Yahshua HaMashiach. Thank the Spirit of the living God, Holy Spirit, for sending angels to help you do everything that you have been commanded to do and you have been put in place to do in the earth to fulfill the promises of God and to preach Jesus, to reconcile souls back to the kingdom of God and to be delivered out of the hands of man. Because why? We are and we are commanded to be witnesses in the earth, witnesses to Jesus. This is the premises of this Acts. You will be my witnesses. That's us brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. Join us on next Tuesday for Pauls. This is lesson 20. On next week, Minister Sarah will do a deep dive with us on this lesson 20, Paul's first missionary journey, his first missionary journey, journey. And there are several parts to this, but look, you can go ahead and start reading and studying now, uh, Acts 12, 25 through 13. And I would say all of you know, that 12, you can go back, revisit what we covered tonight, but go ahead and go ahead and start reading, okay, in uh, Acts 12, 25 through 13, right, and that, that's the 13th chapter, so uh, all the way through uh, 2, 12, all right, so, and you can go ahead, just, just keep reading, because there's several parts of this keep studying and asking holy spirit to supernaturally and divinely unveil this to you to bring you supernatural and divine revelation to show you exactly how this is applicable to your life with these iconic apostles these men <laughs> mighty men of valor and every individual that played a part in the acts of the apostles even the women right that played a part in, you know, ministering the gospel. And, the, you know, listen, as the church continued to grow, the church is to continue to grow even now in these days. And we are not alone. We have angels on assignment who have been assigned to us to help us do what needs to be done. And of course, who do we have? We have Holy Spirit. This is his dispensation to give orders and create, you know, uh, send us out on assignments and to orchestrate all of what we are called to do supernaturally and divinely, to endow us, to embolden us, to give us the tools that we need to carry out the purposes and plans of our Lord and Savior, of our sovereign King, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, where, right where we are, even as marketplace ministers. And if ministry is what you do, don't grow weary. But listen, if maybe you have, we're going to give you the plan of salvation. But again, join us on next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for this lesson. All right. So let's pray with me and just stay on pray and pray for someone else to be saved. Pray for another brother and sister, for another soul. So if you are not praying this prayer of salvation, plan of salvation for yourself, and you're not, you know, rededicating your life tonight, but your heartstrings 
are being tugged on to pray for another soul. Stand in the gap and pray this prayer, okay? Or if you're receiving Jesus Christ into your heart for the very first time, pray this prayer, the plan of salvation and then the deliverance prayer and faith because there are sometimes things that can grab a hold of our soul, our mind, will, and emotions that don't want to let us go. And we need to believe in faith that we can be free of these tormenting spirits, things that have been lodged in our mind, in our will, and our emotions, in our soul, so that we can move forward and not be stuck after we have received Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, into our hearts as our Lord and Savior. So pray this prayer with us. Now, the scripture says in Romans 10, 8 through 11, this is what it says related to this plan of salvation. And that's Romans 10, 8 through 11. It reads, okay. I have it right here, giving you an opportunity to get it too. <laughs> okay, come on, let's read Romans 10, 8 through 11. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Yahshua, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that Elohim, God, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. So pray this prayer with us. It's right here on the screen for you so you can track with us. Pray this prayer in a stance of surrender. This is between you and Yahshua. This is between you and the Holy Trinity. This is between you and the Godhead. Pray this prayer. You've heard the scripture. You know what it says. Now, open up your hearts to receive it and pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Yahshua Jesus, I come before your throne of grace in a stance of surrender with a repentant heart. I confess my sins and I ask earnestly that you would forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. By confessing my sins and asking for forgiveness clears all legal ground that the enemy has against me. Yahshua Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary and on the third day you were raised from the dead. I believe that you transcended into heaven and now sitting at the right hand of Elohim God making intercession for me. I believe that your blood paid for my sins, giving me the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I accept the free gift of salvation and eternal life. Thank you for granting me full access to the kingdom of Elohim God. Now I am seated in heavenly places with you, Yahshua Jesus, with you, Elohim God, for the rest of my life. In Yahshua Jesus' name, I pray, amen, amen, and amen. If you have prayed that prayer, now go ahead and pray this deliverance prayer in faith to be free from any fetters or any chains that bind. Or if you're standing in the gap for someone, pray this prayer. Now that I am saved or have rededicated my life to you, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, I pray by the power of your blood, Yahshua, Jesus, in faith, which commands and evicts every unclean spirit that has held my soul, my mind, will, and emotions, body, and life captive to leave me now and go to the foot of the cross for you, Yahshua Jesus, to do with them what you will. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come into my heart and take up residency within me. Fill me. Fill every vacated place 
in my soul, which is my mind, will, and emotions, my heart, my body, and life with your love, with your light, and with your truth with your divine presence and revelation. Holy Trinity, thank you for fortifying or refortifying my spirit and my soul. Thank you, Yahshua Jesus, for the benefits of salvation, healing and deliverance imputed to me because of what you did on the cross of Calvary. I receive and will maintain my freedom by living a submitted and committed and obedient, dedicated life to you, Holy Trinity. I will live a life of repentance, love, and forgiveness. I will commune with you consistently, Holy Trinity. I will pray, praise, worship, and study your Holy Scriptures. I will live my life from henceforth devoted to advancing your kingdom for the rest of my life. Amen, amen, and amen. Wow. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters in Christ, and those of you who are new <laughs> believers. Welcome to the body of Christ. Now take up your marching orders and follow Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Make sure for those of you who have received Jesus Christ into your heart for the very first time that you get connected to a Bible teaching church. If you need resources, you can reach us here at hisministryonly at gmail.com and Minister Sarah and I, Evangelist Keisha, we will give you the tools that you need. It's so important on this journey that you get connected to a Bible teaching church so that you can understand this word and how it applies to your life so that you can be encouraged by it, so that you know the benefits and the promises that have been imputed to you because of what Yahshua HaMashiach Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. All right, we love you. We love you back. We will see you on next Tuesday. All right, we look, we look forward to seeing you here. <laughs> All right, see you next Tuesday. Hugs, 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 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, whatever time that is, in your time zone. All right. See you next week. <laughs>